All right, let's take a look at 1.6 and 8.3. These two sections are both looking at complex numbers. 1.6 is kind of a review section, so we'll look at a few of those problems. So if you recall, in terms of real numbers, we cannot take the square roots of negatives. However, what if we come up with a definition and what if we just call the square root of negative one i, as in an imaginary number? So that would imply that if I square i, the result is negative one. So these are two little definitions. So what I have in something like number one is I actually have just a multiplication of two. Those are complex numbers. So you can see how each of those has a real part and an imaginary part. So you've got a real part, imaginary part, and that gives me those two parts make up my complex number. Okay, so multiplying those together is actually really easy. I'm just going to use a FOIL. Okay, so that's negative 6 plus 14i plus 3i minus 7i squared. Combining the like terms. And then I have to use my definition. Remember, i squared is negative 1. So then there's my result, my complex number. Again, I've written it in this form where I have a real part and an imaginary part. Okay, how about some of these with exponents? So I'd start by distributing the exponent. Okay, 2 to the 5th, I think that's 32. And then what do I do with the i to the 5th? Well, the thing is, I know i squared is negative 1. So if I could find i squared in here, that would be useful. Now, because 5 is an odd number, what if I start by just breaking that up? Isn't i to the fifth i times i to the fourth? Because you see how here I have one plus four would give me back i to the fifth. Okay. So then what next? Well, i to the fourth is i squared squared, isn't it? Because two times two gives me back four. And then I know i squared is negative one. Oops, let's see, I think I, let's try that step again. 32i and then negative one squared. Negative 1 to an even power is 1. So there's my answer. Now the thing is, usually we're asked, write the answer in the form C equals A plus BI. So in that case, I want to account for the fact that the real part of this number is 0. So I would include zero there just as a placeholder and that's so that my answer is written in the correct format. Okay, number three is very similar. So what I would do with this one, isn't this the same as having negative one times i? To the 37th, that way I can actually distribute the exponent just like I did in the previous problem. Okay, and then negative 1 to an odd power is negative 1. 
break up my i to the 37th is i to the 36 times i to the 1 because 36 plus 1 makes 37. Okay, then let's see, i to the 36, that's i squared to the 18th. i squared is negative 1. I have an even power, so that's going to be a positive 1. So the result is negative i. Now again, just to account for the real part of that number, I'll include 0 there as a placeholder. I bought one more, this is very similar. So again, I have that negative one in front. Distribute that. Negative one to an even power is one. Now this time I have an even power already. So let's see, what is half of 38? 19? one, negative one to an odd power, so that's gonna be negative one, right? So this time my result is just a real number, so I'll account for the imaginary part by including the zero i, and again, that's because I'm asked to write the answers in this form, accounting for both the real and the imaginary part. Okay, what about dividing? So the goal when I'm dividing is to get rid of the i in the denominator. So it's kind of like when we had square roots in the bottom and our goal was to get rid of the square root in the bottom. So the way we do that is we multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. Okay, so in this case, remember the conjugate, I just changed the middle sign. So it's going to be 3 minus 4i. And I'm going to multiply by that top and bottom. Okay, foil on the top. Make sure I got all those right. Looks like it. Okay, and then on the bottom I have a difference of squares. So look at the way this works out. It's 9. Minus 12i plus 12i cancels, right? So actually all that's left is my last term. So that's why this process works, because I actually end up with a difference of squares there. And I am able to cancel out those middle terms. So now let's simplify it. So 15 is 23i, negative 1. 9 minus 16 times negative 1. So you see how I no longer have the i in the denominator. Okay, and so then we typically break this up. That way we have the real part here and then the imaginary part here. And we have our entire complex number. Okay, now 
you can graph complex numbers. We just change the interpretation. In other words, we change the coordinate plane. So instead of representing, you know, the X and the Y axis, now what if we let the horizontal axis be the real axis and the vertical axis be the imaginary axis, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna plot these, these complex numbers. Like look at, let's clean this up, look at number one here. So the real part is one, the imaginary part is two. So when I plot that point, let's see, I just go right by one and up by two. Okay, there's my first complex number, Z1. It's very easy. Okay, what else does it say? Let's see, find its modulus and its conjugate. So we've talked about the conjugate before. We just did, in fact. So for Z1, let's see, the notation for the conjugate is the little star. So for Z1 star, the conjugate is 1 minus 2i. Okay, now I could even graph that guy. See, it'd be right here, right? That'd be Z1 star, the conjugate of Z1. What about this thing, the modulus? So if you look at that, you see those absolute value bars. So absolute value measures distance, right? So this guy is measuring the distance from zero. In other words, like we want to know this distance here. So we could set up a reference triangle and we could actually find that distance, that modulus, just by using the Pythagorean theorem, okay? So let's see, that'd be one squared plus two squared is the modulus of z squared. So what would that be, root five? It's gonna be positive, right, since that's a distance. Let's see what else there is. Let's plot Z2. Should I use a different color for, for Z2? Let's try that one. Okay, so I have to go left by square root of 3. That's like 1.7-ish. And then down by 1. Okay, so somewhere over here. About here, so. There's Z2. Okay, let's see the conjugate of Z2. Change the middle sign. And I could plot that one. Left by 1.7, up by 1. Okay, let's find the modulus, so this distance here. So let's see, I have negative root three, negative one. Pythagorean theorem. So that modulus of C2 would be 2. Get one more. 
So this complex number Z3 actually just has an imaginary part. So the real part would be zero, right? If I wanted to include that as a placeholder. Oh, so let's see, should I choose a color for this guy? Let's try that one. So to, to graph that guy, I would go left and right by zero and down by four. Okay, so there's Z3. Okay, what about the conjugate of Z3? Wouldn't that just be positive 4i or if you like 0 plus 4i? That'd be here. Okay. Well, the modulus... This guy actually is on the imaginary axis, so can't I actually just count that distance? One, two, three, it's four units, right? I don't even need to do a calculation. All right, the next thing we're gonna look at here is, what if I have a complex number, like say one plus i, and I'd like to write that in polar form. So remember, in polar form, how can I incorporate the r and the theta in there? So I kind of started with just a generic example here. Let's say a z equals a plus bi. So say I was to plot that point. So I don't know, say this is a. I'd go right by a and then I'd go up by, you know, b. So here would be, there's my z equals a plus bi. My goal then is to figure out Let's see, the r and the theta. So this side, length is a, this side, length is b, right? And so what could I do there? I guess I could say, well, a squared plus b squared is r squared. I could say tan theta is b over a. Okay, what else could I do? Well, what if I did something like, let's see, the cosine of theta would be a over r. The sine of theta would be b over r. So wouldn't A be R cosine theta and B be R sine theta? So in other words, what if I rewrote this then, filling in my A and my B? So wouldn't this look like, well, A is R cosine theta B is R sine theta, and then times I. So actually that is my polar form. Let me maybe rewrite that up here. Okay, so the polar form of a complex number just looks like, now I'm looking at this, right? Normally what we do is we factor out the R. So it looks like this. So there's my polar form of a complex number. Let me rebox that. Okay, and then of course to fill in 
the r and the theta, I can use these equations. So we'll get to that when we look at the example number one here. But I was going to show you one other form. So it turns out that if I have an exponential, with a i in the exponent. So in other words, I have an r e to the i times something. It turns out that that can be written equivalently in polar form like so. So this guy, they're going to actually show you where this comes from in calculus too. So there's a proof, but it involves a Taylor series so a little, little bit too advanced for this class. So for this class, we're just going to assume that this is true. Okay, assume this is true because you will see the proof of that later. So that means then that, that I can use my equivalent Euler's form should it be useful okay so here I have two forms I have the polar form it's this one and then I have the Euler's form that's this one okay so those are equivalent okay those two things are equal you're not going to see that proof yet but you will so let's take a look at one of the examples and it should be Pretty clear. Okay, so maybe I would start by graphing the complex number. So I'm graphing real versus imaginary. So we'll call this, you know, one. And we'll call that one. Okay, so there's the z, one plus i. Okay, now remember my goal. So my goal, I can even write this out down here. So my goal is to take my one plus i Right now, this is written in the A plus the BI form. My goal is to write this in two ways. Okay, this is the polar form. All I have to do is fill in the R and the theta. Okay, and then I'm done. Okay, then the other form is the Euler's form. Okay, again, so this is Euler's form. All I need is the r and the theta, and then I'm done. Okay, so I have my template already. I know what my answers are going to look like. And I can even box this. As soon as I fill that in, I've completed the problem here. So all I have to do then is, well, I have to find r and I have to find theta. But I can use my reference triangle. So let's see, Pythagorean theorem. Now, I mean, I guess you could have, you know, a plus or a minus there. So I guess to keep things simple, let's go back and do what we did in the previous section where it says, write the complex number in polar form, let's say with r positive and theta in between 0 and 2 pi. That way we have kind of the primary version. We don't have several different representations. So in that case, that means I'll pick 
root 2, positive root 2. So there's my r. Let's fill that in in both of these. Then I just need to find theta. So... So theta would be pi fourths, and that would be in between 0 and 2 pi. So there I have it, all three forms. Now sometimes the question arises, which is, well, what if I have this number, say, in polar form? What if I evaluated, like, okay, let's see, cosine of pi fourths, root 2 over 2, sine of pi fourths, root 2 over 2, distribute, so root 2 times root 2, 2 over 2, oh, that'd be 1, and then root 2 times root 2, 2 divided by 2, oh, I would just get back my a plus bi form, right? So I guess that would be a way to check my answer. But if I wanted the polar form, I wouldn't want to reevaluate that. It wouldn't make sense. Unless I was checking the work. Well, let's start by getting a rough sketch again. of which quadrant this guy is in at least. Okay, so I mean, it doesn't have to be to scale. It could be something like this, say. Okay, and then I have a reference triangle. Okay, so Pythagorean theorem. That's what, 16 times 3? And then that's 16. So I like to keep the numbers small. So I've got 16 times 3 plus 16 times 1. So I've got 4 times 16 there. That way when I take the square root, I can just take the root of each of those factors. Should I write out my template here? Again, I just have to fill in the R and the theta. So the R is 8. Let's get the theta. Rationalize. Okay, so be careful because there are two angles where tangent is root 3 over 3. That's why I always suggest that you look at the quadrant because if you look at the picture here, you can see the appropriate angle is actually 7 pi sixths, okay, not pi sixths. So here's my complex number. It's written in all three forms. Let's see, this is the A plus BI form. It's the polar form. That's the Euler's form. Okay, so then why are some of these things useful? Well, actually, the polar form and especially the Euler's form is useful in doing calculations with complex numbers. So 
If I start with something like this, here I want to multiply these two complex numbers, z1 and z2. I'm going to start by putting these in Euler's form. So that's very easy to do. There's z1. And here is z2. because now if I want to multiply z1 times z2, it's actually really easy to do. Okay, let's see. Well, 2 times 4 is 8. Now, look. I'm multiplying these guys together, right? I have two numbers here with the same base. It's like if I was multiplying these guys. Okay, where were we? So multiplying x squared and x to the fifth, I add the exponents, right? So I would do the same thing here, yeah? Now, these are like terms. They're both in terms of i, right? So I'm really just adding the coefficients. Let's see, a half plus a fourth, two fourths plus one fourth, three fourths. Okay, so then look at that. I multiplied my two complex numbers. Look how easy that was. So then it just depends kind of on what format that the, the answer should be written in. So I mean, the answer then for my z1 times z2, I have the polar form, or in other words, actually, I have the Euler's form. That's what I mean to say. So then how would I translate that depending on the instructions? That's, this is the Euler's form. Okay, here's the polar form. Okay, and then the last one would be the a plus bi form. So to get that, <clears throat> I would actually evaluate. So what is, let's see, cosine of 3 pi fourths, sine of 3 pi fourths, distribute the 8. would look something like that. Okay, so there I have my answer written in Euler's form, in polar form, and in A plus BI form. So again, then that just depends on what form the instructions are asking for. I can divide complex numbers the same way. So here I've got a z1 and a z2. I would start by going ahead and writing those in Euler's form. And then set up the quotient. Okay, four <clears throat> divided by eight is a half. 
Now, looking again at these exponentials, I have to think about exponent rules. So I'm dividing that guy by that guy. So compare that to if I was dividing like, you know, x to the fifth over x squared. You subtract, right? Okay, so I'd have, let's see, 3 fourths minus 5 fourths is negative 2 fourths. Or negative 1 half pi. Okay, so then, I mean, I have an answer. That guy's written in Euler's form. The only thing is this. So, normally in the instructions, it says something like, write your answer with theta between 0 and 2 pi. Okay. So you see my answer there now, negative pi halves is here, right? So I would just need to adjust that answer so that it falls in the correct set. So I would need to write instead of negative pi over two, I'd need to write that angle as three pi over two. But that's not too hard to adjust. Okay, so there's my answer in Euler's form. So then it just depends again on what format we're looking for. So you can rewrite this. Let's see, I could write that as R cosine theta plus I sine theta, that's polar form. I could evaluate, let's see, cosine of three pi over two, zero, sine three pi over two, negative one, And so there's the A plus B I form. Okay, what is one more thing you could do? Well, <clears throat> exponentiating complex numbers is actually one of the places where Euler's form really comes in handy because what you can do here is, so if I was to try to multiply this, you know, in A plus B I form, I'd have to sit there and foil this thing 16 times, right? I don't want to do that. So the goal is, well, what if I could take that 1 plus i and I could put that into Euler's form? So let's do that first. Okay, now I think we did this one earlier. So I mean, there's say one plus i, and I think we had found the radius was root two, and the angle was pi fourths. Okay, so my one plus i written in Euler's form looked like so. Now you can look back 
earlier and see more notes on that if you need to. Okay, so now that I've put that in Euler's form, then I'm going to calculate my z to the 16th. So I'm going to take that, Euler's form, raise it to the 16th. I'm going to distribute my exponent to both factors. Now, here what I have is I have power to a power. So this is like if I had x squared to the fifth, I multiply the exponents, right? Okay, so that means I'm multiplying my i pi fourths times my 16. So I can cancel, right? That's four pi i. So again, there's an answer in Euler's form. And then I just had to go back and say, well, remember, we want to write our answer with theta between 0 and 2 pi. So then let me see here. 2 pi, 4 pi is here, right? So other ways of representing the angle 4 pi would be the angle 0, 2 pi, etc. So which one falls in this set? Well, you see how 0 has the closed bracket, 2 pi has the open parenthesis. That means 0 is included, 2 pi is not. So that means the correct choice for the angle would actually be 0. And then I should simplify, I guess, my root 2 to the 16th. So that's root 2 squared to the 8th. So 2 to the 8th. 2 to the 8th is pretty big. I don't know offhand what that is. I won't bother with it. So there's my... Euler's form, there's my polar form, and then cosine of 0, 1, sine of 0, 0, okay, so here's my Euler's form, my polar form, and my a plus bi form. And one more. Okay, so here's a z, find z to the fifth. Okay, so again, the first thing I would do would be put z in Euler's form. Now, we did this one earlier again, so I'll kind of look quickly here at how we did that, but I'll let you look back at the notes earlier. It was like this, right? There was the point. Okay, and we did the Pythagorean theorem. So that was 16 by 3, 16 by 1. And that's 4 times 16. So then well, R was 8. And then we said tan was negative 4 over negative 4 root 3, so 1 over root 3, 
root three over three, and then we said because of the quadrant, correct choice of the angle was seven pi sixth. So that means in Euler's form, my z was a e to the i seven pi six. Now again, we did that part earlier. So I'll let you refer back up to those notes if need be. Okay, the more interesting part of this guy is actually our goal is to find z to the fifth. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and exponentiate. Okay, again, I don't know what 8 to the 5th is. I won't bother with it. I multiply the exponents here. So that's what? 35 pi 6? Okay, then again, I, I mean, I've got an answer. But 35 pi 6. So I need to reduce that, right? Because I need my theta in that correct set again. So let me just look at 35 pi 6 for a second. So how could I break that down? I got a couple options. I'm looking for things that are divisible by 6. Let me give you a couple ideas here. Okay, there's a couple ways I could write 35 as a sum. There's a difference. Okay, let me look at those. All right, 30 divided by 6 is 5. You have to be careful with this one because you see how here I actually am left with an odd multiple of pi. Remember, odd multiples of pi contribute that term of pi in there. So actually here I'd have, let's see, 6, 6 plus 5, 6, 11 pi 6. So I would conclude that 35 pi 6 is coterminal with 11 pi 6. Now if you use this setup instead... If you say 35, 6 is 24, 6 plus 11, 6, well, 24, 6 is actually 4 pi. So you see there I get an even multiple of pi. So this guy can actually just disregard because I've actually gone two full rotations around the circle. So in this case, I could see immediately that 35 pi 6 is coterminal with 11 pi 6. So same conclusion. Here's even one more thought. Which is, what if I write the 35 pi 6 as 36 6 minus 1 6? So 36 6 is 6 pi, right? So again, there I have an even multiple of pi. So that I can disregard. Okay, so what do I know so far? I know 35 pi 6 is coterminal with negative pi 6. Now, negative pi 6 is still not in the interval that I'm looking for. However, I know where a negative pi 6 is. And so I could conclude that the correct angle would be 11 pi 6, okay? So these are all different ways to reduce that 35 pi 6 so that I have something in the correct interval. Okay, so no matter how you go about doing that, my answer going to look like so. Let's write the 
polar form. Okay, and then should evaluate to get the A plus BI form. I think I would even probably just leave that. Okay, so then let me box my answers. There's Euler's form. There's polar form, and there's my A plus BI.